one of the... You, you, you take your time. They always say you take your time, but finish at 12.30. <laughs> About the only interesting thing I heard this morning from Mr. Paroyan was that his memory was failing. <laughs> He mentioned uh, something indecent and illegal, but I'm sure he's forgotten all about those things by this stage. Experts. You use them to win the case. You use them more and more to win commercial cases. The judge or the jury is your ultimate audience. And what you do is present to that audience, whether it be a single judge or a jury, the most appealing players. You have a lot of difficulty after you have accepted a retainer in your client. You take them the way he is, for better or for worse. And in many, many cases, he gets a lot worse than when he originally comes into, your, he or she comes into your office. Your fact witnesses, you have little control over choosing who is going to be called. Your expert witnesses, you do have control over. You can choose them as actors in your piece. Choose them wisely. Now, why do you hire an expert? Well, that's obvious. There are two real reasons. One you use to back you up without going to trial, to tell you what your case is about, to tell you the intricacies of the case, as an assistant. The other witness, the other expert, goes to trial. He may back you up, up to trial, but he may then have to go into the witness box and be an actor on the stage. If you can find one that is good at preparing and good at going in to the courtroom, then you really have a winner. He also goes to give fact information that he has gathered as an expert and also an opinion arising out of the facts that he has seen and most usually other facts which he hasn't seen and he will, be ha he will have to be given the hypothetical situation questions. Now I want to discuss with you very briefly the costs of experts because this is getting more and more and more important. On page two of my paper, I've said that there are three things in litigation. Quality of litigation, time, and expense. And time and expense is getting more and more meaningful to clients. They're getting, in my view, less and less interested in quality. They want results and they want it fast. And therefore, it's important to sit down with your client at the outset and say, can we afford experts? How much are they going to cost? How are we going to use them? For instance, if a case is $100,000 and the four experts that you want to hire come to $150,000, uh, I don't think the client is going to go along with it. That's the first thing to do, is do a cost analysis of where you're going, because in the end, the client is going to be very unhappy if you win the case and you don't get any money. Client came in a couple of weeks ago to my office. We'd been preparing for a major commercial trial. It was costing a lot of money, and the plaintiff had a very, very good chance of winning a lot of money. And he said to me, I had a dream last night. I had a wonderful dream last night. It was so good that I didn't want to wake up. He said, I dreamt I was going to break even in this case. <laughs> and think about that. Because when you get to the end of this whole scenario you're going through and the client doesn't get anything, he's going to be very upset. When to hire the expert uh, 
as soon as possible. Uh, with the case management system that uh, is, uh, is coming into the, this jurisdiction, the fast tracking of actions, you're going to have to get off the mark very quickly. And in my view, the uh, judges are now going to start pressing you for your experts' reports almost up front. I can just hear them now saying, have you got your experts' report? Well, why not? Well, why don't I give you three or four weeks to get it? Uh, what about the rules? I don't care about the rules. I'm fast-tracking this thing. So that more and more get your experts in the field early. Where to find your experts? Well, you can find them everywhere. I've left a lot of information as to where to find them. Um, but keep in mind that an expert is one thing and an expert witness is another thing. One can be the best expert in the world if that expert cannot express himself to a judge or jury. You don't care how good she or he is if nobody's going to stand up and clap in a courtroom. The great Leo Berman in New York City, the king of the bar down there, once said at a lecture that I was at many, many years ago, my favorite medical expert is Dr. Leibowitz. He said he can't cure a common cold, but he's dynamite in front of a jury. And remember that. Remember Leibowitz. When you interview your experts, see if they're going to be dynamite in front of a court, in front of a judge or a jury. And if the expert turns you off, probably it's going to turn the court off. Now, where do you find them? You can find them anywhere. Usually, I check with uh, colleagues. You can find uh, experts in a field that have uh, given evidence uh, before. I like to get the ones whose evidence has been accepted uh, rather than rejected. Um, Generalists can give you uh, information, um, agencies, um, the bar associations can give you leads. The opposing expert's teacher or superior, if you find that out and he's willing to give evidence, that's a good source. Um, there is a a vast network in the United States, the ATLA advocate, the American Trial Lawyers Association, uh, has a, uh, a great network of where you can find experts on any subject. It might be a good idea for the Advocate Society to create or start an experts bank too. <coughs> Out of town experts. When you're bringing in a foreign or out-of-town expert, you've got to be very careful about local judges and local conditions. Do they know the local conditions and the ground rules? What is the impact of somebody from out-of-state, out-of-country, or out-of-the-province? I was in a trial in Renfrew once, and. The great Jake Dunlop was the plaintiff's lawyer. When the jury came in in the morning, Jake knew everybody by their first name. Unfortunately for me, so did Jake's expert witness. And by the time, the time they finished introducing themselves before the trial even started, I had written out my offer to settle. Watch out of towners coming in to tell locals how it's done. I've left a checklist on page 8. I won't go through that. The checklist is a good thing to just pull out. Have a look at it. It only takes a few minutes. Experts to avoid the hired gun, the man that comes in and tells you exactly what you want to know. Uh, immediately takes your story, they're going to see through him at the trial. 
the regular witness, now the regular witness, if he wins for you, you keep bringing him back. The regular witness who is not believed by the court, either in your cases or others' cases, you don't want. You don't want an argumentative expert witness, you don't want an egoist, and you don't want anybody too ver verbose. Particularly, you don't want one that gets into the witness box and admits that the opposing party's expert is better qualified than he or she is. Check that out before you ever get near the courtroom. Review fees with your expert. Review them at the outset. Set out specifically who is going to pay the fees, how much they're going to get paid, and how they're going to get paid. So that just before the trial of the action, you don't get into a Donnybrook with the expert and he says, I don't want to come. Do not enter any, into any fee arrangement that is contingent upon the success factor or that which is far and away above normal for that, uh, for that expert, that which he should have. You're going to have the expert cross-examined, perhaps, and it could be very fatal to your case. We were in a case in Welland some years ago. The plaintiff called a medical uh, expert from Miami if you can believe it. This is a case in Welland. The medical expert got up, forgot that he had his solid gold Rolex on, and started to take it off as he was going up to the witness stand. And the judge spotted like that like a barracuda with a shiny object, and he didn't like him as soon as he got into the witness box. He didn't wait for anybody to ask him qualifications or anything else. He just said, how much are you getting paid to come up here and give this evidence? And the witness said $10,000. The case dissolved, just dissolved. Don't be afraid to manage your witness. You are running the case, the expert is not. Now, I want to mention just a couple of things because we're at 12.30 here right now. The expert at the discovery stage, and I'm on page 13 now, and I want you to put a question mark beside some of the stuff on that page because the cases are coming at us thick and fast as to what you have to disclose at the examination for discovery. According to the rules, you've got to put up the findings, opinions, and conclusions of any expert that you have at that time. You don't have to cough up any of their backup notes, reports, and all the rest of it. If you are not calling the expert to the trial of the action, you don't have to disclose anything. The expert that you use is backup all the communications between you and he are privileged. Now comes the problem is that you start saying, well, okay, maybe I won't call uh, an expert until after discovery, or I'll call him, I'll engage him, but I won't ask for the report until the day after the discovery. There's a case called Kungi and Fallis where Justice Eberly said that uh, and this was at pre-trial. This isn't in my paper, by the way, so if anybody wants the site, I can give it to them after. And Everly J. said that, and he was talking about a pre-trial, that attempts to scuttle a pre-trial by holding back your expert's evidence, in his opinion, uh, would not be consistent with the counsel's role as an officer of the court. Now, he was really leaning on them to say, look, soon as you get your expert's report or anything near it, you've got to cough it up. Put a question to Mark beside that page. Now, I'm, I'll pass on now to, and I'm passing over all the checklists that you can use, getting ready to trial, 
And let's go to page 20 and just pick it up from there. Now you're at the trial. We've gone all the way through the discovery and the prep for trial in the twinkling of an eye here. Qualifying your expert. There are some, some tips laid out for the qualifying of the expert. Um, the expert doesn't need to have any formal education or training. He can pick it all up by experience. He can have it all by study and no practical experience. Um, if you do not question the expert's qualifications to be an expert, then he will be admitted as an expert and, and your cross-examination will only go to the weight of his testimony. The ultimate issue rule on page 21. This ultimate issue doctrine prevents or prohibits an expert from ex expressing an opinion on the very issue to be determined by the trial judge or the jury. Uh, that's what it says, but that's been kind of watered down uh, over the years so that the experts now can get pretty well to the ultimate issue uh, the court saying, well, okay, we hear what you say about the ultimate issue, but we can decide whether we're going to agree with you or not. The ultimate issue and the hypothetical question kind of blend in together. If your expert witness uh, knows all of the facts, that is, for instance, he's gone out into the field, inspected a boiler, and uh, kind of comes back and says the uh, one valve uh, is broken. Okay, that's a fact. Uh, but if he says, I inspected it, it is broken, I don't know when it got broken, before or after the explosion, uh, then of course someone else has to fill in that information and therefore a hypothetical situation is put to the to the witness now you must be very careful with the witness in setting up the hypothetical situation and i've left some ideas on that the last point i want to talk about and i'll only take a couple of minutes is this raging debate on privilege of the expert witnesses prior notes and conversations with uh, his lawyer and it goes this way the expert is hired he gives a draft opinion he sends it to the lawyer the lawyer says I don't like that opinion uh, I'm sending you an amended version so he sends it back to him they debate it, and then he sends them an even amended, amended version, which has really little to do with the original opinion. To what extent does that information remain privileged? That is, can you cross-examine the witness, the expert at trial, and say, how did you obtain your final report? Well, in British Columbia, the Vancouver Community College case said yes. It is important to get to the truth and the weight of any expert's evidence that he be cross-examined at the trial and made to put up all his drafts, his communications with the solicitor to see if the report was actually his, whether it was influenced by someone else or whether it was his report at all. That case was swallowed by <clears throat> a further case in British Columbia. Now, the flip side of that is in Ontario. And since we're all in Ontario, uh, we'll probably follow Bell Canada and Olympic in York, Mr. Justice Eberle's decision in February of 1989. He rejected the BC case. He looked at everything. He went through it. And he said, I'm weighing the the party's right to obtain the truth against the 
the theory that communications between solicitor and witnesses have to be kept confidential and privileged. And in my view, the privilege outweighs the disclosure. So we didn't have to put up the information. Now, the facts in the British Columbia case were pretty bad because this lawyer had really written the whole report for this expert. And when he got into the witness box and got cross-examined, he just got ripped to shreds. And the judge said a lot of very nasty things about both the lawyers uh, and the, the uh, expert. Now, I wouldn't, and this is my personal view, I wouldn't take this Bell Canada case to the bank. I'm not so sure this is all over yet. Be very, very careful when you are getting your witnesses ready for trial that you are not in a position of having them change their testimony, intimidating them in any way, or sending out. Even if you intimidate them, don't send out any draft revised reports. <laughs> all right, that's all I've got to say. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, David. Um, we'll break now. When we come back, Barbara Grossman will take my place. The lunch is on this floor in the immediate vicinity. We look forward to seeing you back at 2 o'clock. I have to start so we can stick to our time frame. This afternoon's program, uh, which I have the pleasure of uh, chairing, um, is going to pick up on the thread which we left off on this morning. That is the idea of a trial judge uh, commenting that insufficient care and attention was paid to the damage issue and therefore there is not enough evidence before the trial judge to assess damages with the result that damages are being uh, referred on a reference or alternatively uh, counsel deciding to, as Joyce Harris put it, bifurcate their case and deal with the liability issues in one forum and perhaps the damage issues in another forum. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, to deal with the topic, which way to the pot of gold, court reference or arbitration, Master Linton. Uh, Master Linton used to practice in Newmarket and has been a master uh, now in the Ontario Court uh, General Division, uh, formerly the Supreme Court of Ontario, and he is the general reference master. And so if you are dealing with bifurcated cases, you're apt uh, to be in front of Master Linton uh, to prove your damages. Master Linton um, has assessed damages in some cases uh, which have significant notoriety, uh, Mr. Broadloom being one of them, which is a wrongful receivership case, um, another uh, it was the case of Jordan and McKenzie, um, also a business valuation case. Uh, Master Linton is the co-author of a book called Practice on Motions and References. Uh, I commend it to you uh, as you get ready to prepare for references uh, because it covers a number of topics which are rather obscure in any of the other literature. Um, and Master Linton was a member of the planning committee and he helped bring this program to you. Master Linton. Sometimes I think it's the test of good counsel on how well they can keep their judge awake after lunch. Hopefully uh, I'll be able to do that, although I'm used to being listened to because I, I'm in a little different position. Uh, you know, if you're going to do commercial litigation, it's uh, not good enough to say, uh, I'm a lawyer, not a businessman. In commercial litigation, you will be dealing with businessmen, and you should be able to think like one. Otherwise, you will have difficulty in representing your client properly. It won't help. It won't hurt in helping you run your law firm, too. No doubt it's quite obvious 
to everyone present. Uh, to the client, it's not ordi ordinarily the award of damages that matters, but rather it's the net amount after the deduction of costs in obtaining the award that is most important. That is, how much the client is actually going to receive, or as it sometimes put, the bottom line. I add to that the bottom line in after-tax dollars. One thing that I think is very important for a lawyer in dealing with commercial litigation is to keep in mind the tax consequences of the damage award. And if not conversant with the tax law in that respect at an early stage to get tax advice, Any counsel who wishes to represent a client properly in a commercial damages case, or for that matter in almost any other case, must pay attention to the question of the minimization of costs in taxes uh, which the award may attract. A claim for damages may be prosecuted either within the court system or using alternative dispute resolution that is arbitration. However, to have an arbitration, all parties must agree to the process. Sometimes it's overlooked that the federal and provincial governments heavily subsidize the court system by provo providing judges, administrative staff, and supplies and court facilities which, while charging relatively low user fees. At present in Ontario, arbitrations involving the assessment of damages in commercial cases are not subsidized, as they are in part in BC, I understand, but are paid for by the parties. Unless the fees and disbursements lawyers charge to their clients are reduced tremendously by arbitrating instead of using the courts, then simple arithmetic suggests that there will be no cost savings by using alternative dispute resolution. If there will be no savings in costs, then why arbitrate? Perhaps privacy, or speed, or a more satisfactory decision? Court proceedings must be conducted in public unless otherwise ordered. You should look at Section 145 of the Courts of Justice Act with respect to this, where it indicates that all court hearings, unless otherwise ordered, must be held in public. Not only must the court proceedings be conducted in public, but the documents are available for inspection to the general public unless a document is ordered to be sealed. And you should look at Section 147 of the Act in that regard. I might point out that this becomes particularly important in cases, this isn't directly dealing with damages, but I draw it to your attention in any event, in cases involving the uh, fixing of or finding of uh, fair market value for purposes of sale, too often appraisals are thrown in the file upon which uh, a finding with respect to listing price or the, uh, for the assessment of offers uh, and the, anyone who's interested in purchasing the property, if they're sophisticated uh, or have lawyer's advice, will know that unless they're sealed, they can come and get the, the master's file and look and see exactly what the appraisals say. Sometimes that puts the parties in a, somewhat a dis disadvantage in selling, at least if they want to maximize what they get for the property. Needless to say, there may be certain commercial cases where the parties cannot demonstrate the possibility of serious harm if the hearing is held in public, and so they can't satisfy the test that's set out under the rules. But uh, they may still want privacy for a variety of legitimate reasons. Possibly uh, they will not want to air their dirty linen, linen in public. Arbitration would be more advantageous to the parties in that situation, providing, of course, that privacy is more important than the extra cost which may be involved. From a practical point of view, a reference before a master or a referee is almost always conducted with just the parties and their witnesses present. However, that is 
uh, normally the case of trials too, uh, anyone who's done counsel work knows that you know, very often you'll sit in a great huge courtroom with about five people present. It, it, to me that's always seemed to be a rather useless waste of space, but I guess if it makes the uh, administration of justice look better, uh, we, we should tolerate it. I question that though. However, as I say, uh, normally in, in, with, with respect to trials, very few people attend. Uh, but there seems to be less public and media interest in references than court cases. And that's probably because less is known about references. If the parties don't tell the media, they will have far more difficulty in finding out where a reference is being conducted than a trial. Some of you may not be aware that a system of case management has been used at Toronto in the master's office and in other parts of Ontario by referees long before the experiments being tried with court cases in Windsor and Sault Ste. Marie. Specifically, I draw your attention to Rule 55.01, which reads as follows, and I, I'll read it verbatim because I think it's important, if you haven't already read it, that you should know, know what it contains, and if you have read it, to have your memory refreshed. One, a referee shall, shall, subject to any directions contained in the order directing the reference, devise and adopt the simplest, least expensive, and most expeditious manner of conducting the reference, and may, A, give such directions as are necessary, and B, dispense with any procedure ordinarily taken that the referee considers to be un unnecessary, or adopt a procedure different from that ordinarily taken. Two, a referee shall report on any special circumstances relating to the reference, and shen shall generally inquire into, decide, and report on all matters relating to the reference as fully as if they had been specifically referred. Three, subject to subrule one, a reference shall be conducted as far as possible in accordance with rules 55.01 to 55.07. This rule offers broad scope for the imaginative lawyer or referee. Time limits can be modified and unnecessary procedures eliminated. There is no prima facie right to cross-examine on affidavits or to have examinations for discovery in a reference proceeding. Leave must be obtained from the referee. Subrule 55.02.15 reads as follows. The referee may require any party to be examined and to produce such documents as the referee thinks fit and may give directions for their inspe inspection by any other party. In cases where relatively small amounts of money are involved or little will be gained, usually leave will not be granted. Similarly, I, I should say with this exception, that uh, almost in every case uh, a, a, an order for the production and inspection of documents will, given, will be given subject to terms. If there are a large number of documents, then uh, it may be that the costs of reproducing them will, will be required if copies are, are needed. Similarly, although there is a prima facie right to examine witnesses orally at the reference hearing, the referee may direct otherwise, which means, of course, using affidavits and transcripts or agreed statements of fact. See subrule 55.0213. If the party having courage is dilatory in prosecuting the reference, another party may apply to the referee for a transfer of courage to speed things up. So you can change horses in midstream. See subrule 55.0212. Parties do not have to take out formal orders or reports for directions to be binding because the referee's notes in the referee's procedure book are binding. See subrule 55.0211. And I, I would point out for those of you who do have references that you're going to search around a long time to find my endorsements on the back of any of the documents in the file, because that's just not the reference procedure. Uh, my endorsements must be by the rules made in my procedure book, which is available for inspection by any of the parties, or, or for that matter, anyone else, a matter of public record. And uh, 
uh, for those involved in the proceeding, uh, a photocopy of the relevant endorsement will be provided upon request. However, I would indicate that, as the rules say, you don't have to take out the formal order unless you deem it necessary. All of these sub-rules and more help to speed up the proceedings, keep the cost down, and achieve the objection, I'm sorry, objective of case management. To wit, an early fixed trial date at a minimum of cost while hopefully providing justice at the same time. The objective of case management is not to dispose of cases speedily, but rather to provide speedy justice with emphasis on justice. At present, references in the master's office at Toronto operate on a fixed appointment system. And at this time, directions may be obtained and motions and references may be heard on any Monday or Tuesday, if Monday happens to be a holiday or the master happens to be participating in a seminar. Hearing dates for references, which are really trial dates, are available within about one month for reference hearings expected longer than a day, two and a half months. So you can get a fairly quick hearing, at least at the present time, with references. The probabilities are, however, that it will take longer and longer to have references heard unless the government changes its policy of not appointing any new masters. There has been a tremendous increase of work in the master's office to, due to court merger, and you're probably tired of hearing about it, and the downturn of the business cycle. But of course, one has to take into account the fact of population growth too. At present, the master system for conducting references seems to be working fairly well. How long that will continue is questionable. The quickest way of having damages assessed in the master's office is to have the whole action referred rather than by just having the assessment of damages referred. Perhaps under merger and with the budgetary restrictions which presently exist, which may prevent the early introduction of case management, at least in the Toronto region, Council may have to consider requesting judges appointing themselves as, as referees. And I would point out that there is a change in my paper at this point on page six. This could have been done under the old rules, but was seldom used. And by reason of an amendment, it can be done now. See rule 54.03. So actually, the present time in Toronto, there is a system leaving aside the uh, attempts at case management otherwise for there to be case management by a referring judge referring a case to himself as referee under Rule 55. Uh, sorry, actually it's 54. And if you're thinking of uh, having a reference or you are involved in a reference, I implore you, please read 54 and 55 in the rules. They're fairly short. They set out the code and it would be an immense help to you. Although there have been a few orders of reference referring the whole action, usually the order is made after the trial where the liability issue has been decided and the issue of assessing damages has been referred. Needless to say, this is a much slower process because the parties have to wait for the trial to be heard and then wait again for the reference to be heard. By reason, among other things, of a wait for the decision in a similar case in the Supreme Court of Canada and an appeal to the court, to the Ontario Court of Appeal, it took about 10 years for the assessment of damages on a reference in Mr. Broadloom and the Bank of Montreal, which I heard not too long ago. I might say that the way it worked out, uh, uh, with the addition of damages calculated simply rather than compounded, that the uh, on my award, and I, I have to admit this, uh, uh, Justice Hughes didn't uh, see completely eye to eye with me and that he did not confirm my report, but uh, on the basis of the award that I made, uh, with simple interest, the damages uh, were less by about one-third than the, uh, than the award as a whole. The rest was interest. So 
you should be careful of interest. It can mount up even when calculated simply. The interest amounted, as I recollect, to about $2 million. Where large sums of money are involved, as there was in this case, however, delay becomes somewhat more tolerable. Probably on the average, a reference can be concluded as quickly, if not more quickly, that is at the present time, than an arbitration. And this will continue to be so, providing people are available to hear them. By reason of the broad scope for adopting whatever procedure which may be appropriate, clearly the reference has more flexibility than a court case heard in the usual way, and as much flexibility as an arbitration. As a matter of fact, uh, the, the similarities between arbitrations and references are so, uh, so much alike that uh, there is a, an older case where a judge actually confused the reference process and the arbitration process, and a higher court had to set him straight. At least in cases involving technical matters, such as construction, engineering, or architecture, some parties prefer to have experts in the field as their arbitrator, who are in effect privately paid judges. On the other hand, some fear that an expert may, be, may use personal knowledge and experience consciously or unconsciously rather than the evidence of the witnesses who may be experts too as the basis upon which to make a decision. Needless to say, it may seem to be an uphill battle to attempt to contradict the opinion of the expert hearing the case. Wouldn't it be rather untoward to cross-examine the judge? However, lawyers or others who are experienced, knowledgeable, and capable may be used as arbitrators, in which case the arbitration can be very similar to a court case especially when the arbitrator is a retired Supreme Court justice like R.E. Holland or John Osler. Within the court system, there is specialization. A body of people has and can be built up who develop a greater degree of skill and expertise in handling certain types of cases or certain aspects of cases. Clearly, the master's have a greater degree of knowledge and experience in dealing with pretrial procedure matters than any other group in the province by reason of the fact that they specialize. Similarly with construction lands, and so too with bankruptcy, assessments of costs, and references. There are, of course, drawbacks too, and this does not just apply to the master's office, in that if there are only one or two in a particular area, it makes it harder for counsel to judge shop, and in the absence of clear evidence or bias, they may be stuck with a master or a judge who they don't like. Where there are very large volumes of paper to handle, as often can be the case in commercial cases, or many items of damages to be dealt with, having someone who has had ex experience may be of some advantage. This does not relieve the counsel of the principal role of presenting or responding to the case or claim in an orderly way, but sometimes it can be of help to have someone who has had some experience, especially if one or both counsel haven't. Mr. Justice Ari Holland, as he then was, had sufficient confidence in the master's office to assess damages involving millions of dollars uh, when he referred the assessment of damages in international corona and lack minerals to the master's office. As you uh, have heard, uh, his decision, including uh, the reference to the master's office, was affirmed by the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, in some ways, I was rather looking forward to receiving that reference uh, on the other hand, I'm uh, fairly glad that it was settled because it probably would have taken at least a year to have heard the uh, reference with respect to damage, damages. And uh, I, I have to say that uh, the order of reference that uh, Mr. Justice Holland made in that case, uh, in particular with 
with respect to the general damages, which went something like this, that uh, I fixed damages in the amount of, and I've forgotten the exact number of millions of dollars, but it was in excess of $100 million. Uh, he tended to refix damages in that amount. And he he, then he said, but if the parties can't agree to that, then there'll be a reference to the master to decide what the damages should be, which, uh, so far as I know, is unique in dealing uh, uh, with orders of reference. I, I can't think of any uh, before that have been like that. On a reference hearing, there's a degree less formality than in a, a, cor in a court uh, before a judge. The masters wear a robe, counsel do not. The master does not use a registrar to handle the exhibit, a judge does. The master may, if there are many items of damages to be considered, direct the preparation and delivery of a detailed statement of claim, numbering and setting out with some particularity the items being claimed with a total, verified by affidavit. A statement of objections setting out what the objections are, verified by affidavit, with a view to narrowing the issues and disputed items which will be dealt with at the hearing and providing a basis for cross-examination. I couldn't help thinking, you know, uh, and I guess it should be obvious, but, uh, you know, uh, in the master's office, we do deal with the adequacy of statements of claim. Sometimes counsel seem to forget what the words statement of claim actually mean, and that means you're supposed to state what your claim is uh, as well as you can. And as the statement of claim is ordinarily the basis upon which you put in your, uh, your evidence, and uh, at the trial, it's the, ordinarily the first thing the judge reads. And if first impressions are important, then you, you should give very serious consideration of at least making your statement of claim intelligible, and I've seen many that aren't. Cross-examinations are preferred to examinations for discovery to avoid motions. The master may also, either at the beginning, during, or at the conclusion of the hearing, request the preparation and filing of a Scott schedule by counsel setting out the items in dispute and each side's position on them in schedule form with vertical columns to simplify complex and complicated cases. These schedules really help to settle cases. Uh, Master Sissi uses them as does Master Saunders too in, in uh, construction land cases. We're not sure whether it is because of counsel's dread of having to prepare them or because it forces them to come to grips with the <laughs> specifics of their cases and helps to organize your thinking I hasten to state that these schedules are requested because of the genuine assistance they offer to the referee rather than to force an unwanted settlement on the parties, which would be improper. Now, I was going to conclude by saying I'm not here to promote more business and that if you want damages assessed in commercial cases by a referee in the master's office in Toronto, the chances are I'll be the master who will hear the case. But I have uh, two more items I want to address that are not in the printed material, but I think you may find of interest to you. They're afterthoughts. Firstly, with the prospect of court proceedings being televised, the fear of some counsel and most witnesses and parties of speaking in public becomes a very important consideration and a consideration that may have been overlooked in the current debate. Many parties and witnesses are reticent when it comes to giving evidence in open court. When I was in practice, a judge appointed me to represent a juvenile on a charge of attempt murder. She was so afraid of having to give evidence and not because she had no defense, in fact she had a, an excellent defense, that she wanted to plead guilty to the charge of attempt murder to avoid having to give evidence. The fear is very real. It is to be hoped that some consideration will be given 
to the effect upon witnesses agreeing to give testimony in the debate over television in court. Unless both parties agree, arbitration proceedings cannot be televised. In the future, this could be a factor in the choice of form. Secondly, remember that a professional arbitrator, if he wants the parties and lawyers to employ him or her again, probably will have to treat them nicely. You may say, what's wrong with that? Could a conflict arise when a lawyer is doing a poor job or abusing the process or a party is lying when it comes to the need for the arbitrator to make appropriate comment during the arbitration or in the award? Some parties who are involved in a lot of arbitrations keep score, you know. If the arbitrator chairman too often decides against them, they will not agree to his or her choice as a chairman in the future. A judge's and referee's livelihood is not dependent upon the favor and satisfaction of the lawyers or parties who appear before them. Good luck with your choice of forum for your client's assessment of damages. We're going to move on now in uh, this phase of the program to examining damages in particular types of cases. And uh, we have uh, three cases that uh, your planning committee decided to hone in on. Uh, the first of which is maximizing damages in real estate transactions, uh, particularly in Toronto with the downturn in the real estate market. Uh, many of you uh, have been already and, and will be if you haven't yet been experiencing an increase in the number of cases you have that arise out of uh, aborted or troubled real estate transactions. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Paul Perel, who will be uh, delivering the next paper on that topic. Um, he's eminently qualified to do so um, since he wrote the book, um, Remedies and the Sale of Land. Uh, I've had frequent uh, occasion in the last few years to refer to it, and I commend it to you. He's also the author of a second book, The Fusion of Law and Equity. Uh, Paul is a partner in the law firm of Weir and Folds, and he is the director of research and continuing legal education at that firm. In his former incarnation, uh, he was a civil litigator dealing with commercial cases, uh, just as we are, and uh, perhaps it's for that reason that he, his writing uh, is so useful uh, to litigators who are trying uh, their best to understand the complexities of the commercial transactions that they're litigating. Paul? Thank you very much, Barbara. The case law about damages for abortive real estate transactions follows the fortunes of the real estate market. During the recent boom years, when land values were spiraling upwards, the damages and specific performance claims were advanced by purchasers seeking to hold their vendors to the contract. Now that market values are plummeting, it is vendors who are suing for damages or for specific performance. Unfortunately, given the pace of uh, litigation, the law reports will now be reporting cases from the boom years, while we'll, we'll be advising clients and starting new cases about abortive real estate transactions in hard times. There is, however, much about a vendor's claim that is similar to a claim by a purchaser. And there are, however, some differences. And what I hope to do today is to point out some of the differences and some of the similarities and highlight some of the aspects that I deal with in more detail in my written paper. Generally speaking, whether the claim is by a vendor or by a purchaser, the damages from an abortive real estate transaction are governed by the first principles of the law of contract. Most of the complications in this area of the law arise because of real property law and the law of equity that allows a vendor or purchaser 
to assert a claim for specific performance, an alternative claim. The innocent party is allowed to sue in the alternative, but must eventually elect between the two remedies, because they're inconsistent with one another. And that election can be postponed until the trial of the action. And it is that aspect, that possibility, that causes much of the confusion and much of the difficulties. Now, if we apply the first principles of the law of damages for breach of contract, the goal is to use a monetary award to readdress the disappointed expectations of the innocent party. The goal is to put the innocent party in the position he or she would have been had the contract been performed. Now, those first principles also require that the damages claimed be reasonably foreseeable and that they be proved with reasonable certainty by the innocent party. The innocent party is obliged to mitigate or avoid loss if that is reasonably possible. And the onus is on the defendant to prove that the plaintiff innocent party failed in his or her duty to mitigate. Now, you're all very well aware of uh, those principles. Let me explain to you how they are applied in a board of real estate cases. If we look first at the claim of a vendor, if the contract is completed, then the vendor is paid the purchase price and conveys the land. Thus, the vendor's expectation of performance is to receive money in exchange for land. If the purchaser refuses to perform, then the vendor is left with the land and the purchaser's deposit. So the vendor principally suffers damages or has a disappointed expectation when, because of falling land values, the vendor loses the benefit of his or her bargain. The vendor may also suffer consequential losses from the purchaser's failure to perform. Now for the vendor, the benefit of the bargain is to sell the land at the contract price. The measure of the loss of the benefit of that bargain is the difference between the contract price and the value of the land with which the vendor is left. The vendor, in any event, must give credit for the deposit. Now, if the vendor can immediately, or in a short period of time, resell the land at the same price or at a better price, then the vendor has suffered no loss, save for consequential damages, which we'll come to. But most of the time, the consequential damages are relatively modest. But even if the vendor suffers no loss, the vendor gets to keep the deposit. Now, pausing there, we have a very simple formula for the principal head of damage in a claim by a vendor. It's the loss of the benefit of the bargain, and the formula is the difference between the contract price and the value of the land. And that formula has one constant and one variable. The constant, of course, is the contract price. It does not change. And the variable, as we and some of our clients very painfully know, uh, is the value of the land, which goes up and down. Now, if land values are falling, then the vendor will maximize his or her or its claim for damages by persuading the court to select the latest date possible in a falling market, because that's the date that maximizes the spread, the differential between the contract price and the value of the land. Now, in theory, that late date can be achieved by suing for specific performance. Specific performance keeps the contract alive. A claim for specific performance means that the innocent party is not accepting the other side's breach as a termination of the contract. In effect, specific performance avoids the obligation to mitigate and is capable of postponing the date for the assessment of damages. Now, if we ignore for a moment that claim for specific performance, the law of contract damages by itself would pick as the date for the calculation of the value of the land, 
the date that the contract was supposed to be completed. That date is selected because it is the date that best reflects or corresponds with the vendor's expectation interest. It is the date when he or she was scheduled to receive the money. And if that date is selected or a day shortly thereafter, uh, the formula uh, for the calculation of damages makes sense and it uh, responds or respects the duty of the innocent party to mitigate. So on, by picking that date, it allows the vendor to go to the marketplace and see if the property can be resold without a loss. That the closing date is the date for valuing the land left with the vendor is one of the lessons of the Court of Appeals decision in 100 Main Street Limited and W.B. Sullivan Construction Limited. And that is a case that's worthy of some close study by those wishing to appreciate the nuances of a claim in an abortive real estate transaction case. The problem for the court in the 100 Main Street Limited case was that the closing date for the sale of an apartment building was tied to the completion of the construction of the apartment. The purchaser breached the contract before the construction was completed. The vendor immediately sued for specific performance or for damages in the alternative. The vendor, a few months later, then abandoned the claim for specific performance and pursued only the claim for damages. Now the trial judge, unfortunately, did not make a finding about when the contract or when the construction would have been completed. Thus, uh, Mr. Justice Morden, who delivered the judgment for the Court of Appeal, could only direct a new trial for the assessment and provide some assistance by describing how the damages in such a case should be calculated. And his judgment, in my view, is a short treatise on the law of damages and contains a number of important lessons. Now, in the 100 Main Street case, the purchaser's breach was an anticipatory breach. Now, in a board of real estate transactions, the fact of the matter is, is that anticipatory breaches are relatively rare, or, are they only, or they're only briefly anticipatory, coming a short time before the scheduled closing. A lot of letters are written about you've anticipatorily breached the contract, but it's usually a day before the closing when those letters are written. But this case highlighted a clear anticipatory breach because the breach took place months before the contract could have been completed because of the construction. And Mr. Justice Morden rejected as the appropriate date for the calculation of damage the day of the breach. And he emphasized rather the expectation interest that damages should be calculated as at the closing. Now that was subject to, the, to some adjustment if it was shown that the innocent party failed to mitigate, because then the court will pick a date when mitigation should have taken place. But there was no evidence or failure to mitigate in that case. So Mr. Justice Morden could pick the date for the closing of the transaction. The difficulty, of course, was nobody knew what that date was. Now, Mr. Justice Morden's judgment recognized that the vendor's claim for specific performance, which lasted for a few months, put off the date for the selection of the date of assessment. What his lordship again could not determine was whether or not the, the abandonment of the claim for specific performance came before or after the date for the calculation of damages. And once again, the whole matter had to be resolved by a new trial. Now, in the course of his judgment, Mr. Justice Morden also commented about the situation of a rising market after the date of assessment. And he noted that it is not open to a guilty purchaser to argue that the innocent vendor suffered no losses because the market reversed itself and was now boom times again. Once the appropriate date of 
assessment is selected, then subsequent fluctuations in the market do not affect the calculation of damages. In the 100 Main Street case, the vendor had not actually resold the apartment to crystallize the loss of the benefit of the bargain. But the absence of a resale did not prevent the court from calculating damages. And that is another important lesson from the 100 Main Street case. Now there is a, I think, widely held mistaken view that in order to prove damages, the vendor must actually resell the property. And the rationale, apparently, for that belief is that the resale provides the value of the land to be applied in the formula that I have described. In truth, a resale of the property is only evidence of the value of the land. If the resale comes after the date of assessment, it may be necessary to adjust the resale value back to the date of assessment. And that's the sort of thing that is well within the competence or expertise of appraisers. Now, in most of Board of Real Estate cases, the damages are, in fact, proven by appraisal evidence. It will be your job as trial counsel to instruct the expert to appraise the property as of the appropriate date for assessment. Now, usually, the expert is instructed to value the lands as at least two dates. The first date is the date set for closing, and the second date is the date when the claim for specific performance is abandoned. Now, in most cases, the parties hedge their bet and don't abandon specific performance until the eve of trial, or even potentially, I suppose, up to argument in a trial. And so damages are quite frequently calculated at or about the time of the trial. Now, if we turn to the purchaser's claim, the purchaser's expectations will be disappointed if the vendor fails to complete and once again, the purchaser has the alternative claims of specific performance and damages. And once again, the first principles are applied to this claim as they were to the vendor. And once again, the purchaser's principal head of damage is a claim for the benefit of the bargain. The purchaser's expectation, of course, is the opposite of that of the vendor. The purchaser expects to pay money and to obtain land. If the vendor fails to convey, the purchaser is left with the purchase money, or in theory is left with the purchase money, and has the ability to use that purchase money to mitigate and find a substitute property. If the purchaser goes back to the market and finds that land values have risen, then it will cost more for the purchaser to, pop, to buy a replacement or comparable property. And that's the loss of the benefit of the bargain for the purchaser. So the formula for the purchaser once again has the same ingredients. They're just reversed in their order. The formula for purchasers is it's the difference between the value of the land and the contract price. And the value of the land, once again, uh, the, the crucial ingredient is what date do you pick to value the land. Now, in any event, uh, the purchaser will want to get back his or her deposit. And if land values have fallen, I suppose the purchaser uh, can be grateful uh, for the uh, vendor's default and uh, the purchaser will have found an out uh, from an improvident transaction, but the innocent purchaser will always want uh, the return of his or her deposit uh, with interest uh, for the loss of the use of that money. Now. You will have appreciated uh, from my remarks that the claim for specific performance uh, has a fundamental effect and that it is often uh, pursued uh, by innocent uh, vendors or by innocent purchasers in order to secure the effect of delaying or postponing the date for the assessment of damages to pick a more opportune date. Now, Recent case law, however, has questioned whether a claim for specific performance ought to be used in this way. In Azamara Oil Corporation versus Sea Oil and General Corporation, the Supreme Court of Canada considered the conflict between the duty to mitigate 
and the claim for specific performance. And that was a case involving the failure to return corporate shares. And the court concluded that the principle of mitigation should prevail over the claim for specific performance unless the, a substantial and real interest was being advanced by the claim for specific performance. In other words, a party could not simply assert a claim for specific performance as a means to avoid the duty to mitigate. Now, the Azumara case has recently been applied in cases involving the sale of land. In the Ontario case of East Walsh Homes Limited and Anatole Developments Limited, a vendor breached an agreement to sell 147 building lots. The purchaser was awarded damages but denied the claim for specific performance. The court concluded that the purchaser did not have a legitimate interest in seeking specific performance and ought to have mitigated by going out and finding other lots upon which to build. The Azumara case was applied to a vendor's claim in British, by the British Columbia Court of Appeal in the decision of Ansdell versus Crowther. In that case, a vendor was selling a home property and knew very early in the piece that the purchaser was unable to complete the transaction. Instead of mitigating, the vendors decided to take their property off the market. Now, they advanced a claim for specific performance and damages, and the trial judge, uh, because of the claim for specific performance, selected the date for trial as the date of assessment and awarded $48,000 for damages. This, was, this, this judgment was altered by the Court of Appeal in British Columbia, who reduced the damages to $12,000. The court viewed the circumstances and held that the claim for specific performance um, ought not to have been advanced, that the vendor ought to have gone back to the marketplace uh, promptly. They picked a date one month after the closing of the transaction and that resulted in a new calculation and the reduction of damages. Now it is worth noting uh, in the Ansdell case uh, that the vendor did, in not, did not in fact uh, mitigate. Rather, uh, the vendor was treated as if it ought to have mitigated. A lesson uh, to be taken from that is that uh, trial counsel representing defendants will also have to be prepared uh, to advance appraisal evidence. The appraisal evidence will be advanced uh, to meet the anticipated appraisal evidence from the plaintiffs, but also uh, should be advanced uh, to complement the argument that the innocent party failed to mitigate. And you'll have to have a theory as of the date when the uh, innocent party should have mitigated. And that means that uh, defense counsel uh, may be instructing their appraisers uh, to value the land as of possibly three dates. Uh, the first date would be the date uh, set for closing. The second date uh, would be the date set for uh, trial in anticipation that that's the date that the innocent party will select. And the third date will be a date uh, where the argument is made the innocent party ought to have uh, mitigated. Now, it's only fair to point out that there are other cases where the Azumara principle has not been applied. And it remains, in my view, an element of some uncertainty as to whether or not uh, the principles of Azumara uh, will uh, always apply to real estate transactions. The difficulty is that there is a uh, centuries-old tradition respecting the availability of a claim for a specific performance in real estate transactions. And particularly in the case of purchasers, um, there is a real argument to be made that the property may be unique and that would legitimize the claim for specific performance. That uh, argument, of course, uh, diminishes if we're dealing with uh, almost fungible condominium units, but uh, it's an argument that uh, uh, has traditionally garnered a great deal of respect and observance by the courts. Now let me conclude by briefly dealing uh, with uh, consequential damages and to uh, point out um, one uh, recent uh, development that was interesting in this particular area. Now as I said earlier, 
consequential damages tend to be quite modest in uh, this area of the law and they basically deal with costs that are thrown away or expenses that are occurred as a result of the transaction uh, failing to close. And under this head of damages, uh, purchasers have received compensation for amongst other things, legal costs thrown away, extra costs of moving and storage, uh, the expenses associated with obtaining uh, a, an extension of a mortgage and that sort of thing. Under this head of damage, uh, vendors have been compensated for amongst other things, the legal costs of the abortive transaction, extra real estate fees that may have to have been paid, uh, commission, uh, costs incurred to uh, repair the property uh, to make it uh, saleable. Now, one, the one very interesting uh, new aspect or potentially new aspect uh, or clarity in this area of consequential damages um, occurred in a recent uh, decision of the uh, Ontario Court of Appeal. And the Court of Appeal in the case of Kasikis and Tesler uh, dealt with the problem of um, the chain reaction uh, that can occur when one real estate transaction fails to close. As frequently, a vendor uh, will also be a purchaser and the vendor will be relying on the funds from uh, his or her sale as the purchase monies to complete a purchase. And if the uh, vendor's sale uh, is not uh, completed, then the vendor is exposed to being the defendant uh, in another litigation. In the Kasikis case, the Ontario Court of Appeal concluded that it was a problem of foreseeability whether consequential damages from the first transaction would include compensation for the damages, costs, and legal expenses incurred as a result of the failure of the second transaction. Now, if it can be said that the guilty purchaser knew or reasonably ought to have known that the vendor was dependent on the sale proceeds, and that will frequently be the case, then this type of consequential damages may be awarded and may be quite considerable, obviously, because they will stack damages uh, and may even duplicate or exceed the claim that would arise from the first abortive transaction. So with that, uh, let me conclude and let me um, hope that my remarks are of assistance to you in advising clients uh, both in these hard times and in the boom times to come. Thank you. We're going to take a brief break. If you can keep it to 10 minutes, uh, we'll be on track and I urge you to return after the break to hear the last two papers.